here? Is that? Okay. I am Joni Lutke, and this is Alicia Mallinger. We are the co-founders of the West Dallas, West Milwaukee Hero and Opia Task Force. And we are here today to talk to you um, as part of our prescription drug awareness campaign. We are trying to raise awareness of the pos potential risks that are associated with prescription pain medication and just to give information and strategies to prevent abuse and addiction. We all know that addiction is a disease. It is a disease that does not have any boundaries. It does not care if you are rich or poor. It does not care the color of your skin, if you are popular or not. It doesn't care how close you are to your family. It doesn't care who you love or who you don't love. And it doesn't care how old you are. My hope is that by sharing this information, we can raise awareness and that all of you will know more than I did 15 years ago when this started for our family. Um, you see, we thought we were doing everything right. We were involved in our kids' lives. We, uh, um, as parents, we had jobs that were community-based for the most part. I was on school board. I was part of Rotary, the Chamber of Commerce. I was at all my kids' activities. But not, we also, we ate dinner at the table, you know, with our kids. And they say that's one of the most important things you can do. We still, we did all of that. But my youngest daughter, when she was in sixth grade, she came down with uh, illness. She came down with mono, strep, and pneumonia all at the same time. And doctors later said that that is probably what blew out her autoimmune system and caused her that she had autonomic dysfunction, which is an autoimmune disease that causes extreme pain in her extremities. So we went doctor to doctor at Children's Hospital week after week for them to try to diagnose her and they all kept giving her pain medication. Now as parents, we didn't know what we know now. We did not know how devastating and the continued use of pain medication could cause an addiction. We did not know that those um, ages 12 to 25 who use pain medication are much more likely to become addicted and suffer an addiction. Uh, this is a picture of my daughter when she was younger um, before and when she first started to get really, really sick. Now going to the, med to the doctors and getting all these pain medications, they tried different things. Some were narcotic based, most were some were not, but again, we never knew to ask anything. We assumed that because they were doctors, they, they were doing the right thing. And you know, as a mom, my daughter wasn't in as much pain, and I wanted her to be okay. I didn't want to watch her suffer. Um, I, I did not know the risks that were involved. The summer before she turned 16 years old, she went in inpatient treatment for an opioid addiction. And that would be the first of many. By the time she was 18 years old, um, she had come out of treatment. She was not using the pain pills as much, I guess. Uh, but she was still smoking marijuana, drinking. And at 18, she had a little boy. Uh, he wasn't so little. He broke her tailbone on delivery. He was eight pounds, nine ounces. He was huge. And she's a little teeny tiny. Well, when she um, had him, when, when she broke her tailbone, her doctor sent her home with a prescription for 90, 90 opiates. Now, he knew that she was a recovering opiate addict. It was all over her charge. I'm sure that I said it to him at least 10, 15 times going to her with a, at appointments, but he still gave them to her. That really just sent her into a whirlwind. Um, when she finished those 90, she stole from us. She did everything that she could to get more. She never bonded with her son. Um, when he was three years old, I had filed for guardianship, and we lost. The courts said, no, that's his mom. He belongs with his mom. Um, which was just such, 
It was so sad, all of it. Uh, that's a picture of my daughter in active addiction. Uh, that's her son with the red shirt. Uh, we call those now sad eyes. She, she, is, the left. she is. She is on the left, okay. sitting there with the blonde hair. Yep. Yep. And um, Ryder went to play therapy, and he's done a lot of therapy since then. And when he sees this picture, he would he had told his therapist, "My mommy's very sad because she couldn't take care of me, and she would leave me alone, and she was really sick." He just turned three, correct? No, he just turned two. That was his, that was his second birthday. Um, from that point, Ryder would come stay with us for periods of time, sometimes for a week, sometimes for two weeks, sometimes more than that. Uh, but whenever Andrea needed something, she would take him back because she knew that I mean, I wasn't going to let my grandson go without food. I wasn't going to let him go, you know, without a home over his head. And that battle continued for about three years. Um, I would just constantly go by his by her house. I would find him soaking wet in a diaper at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, not being fed. I documented everything from the time we went to court when he was three months old, uh, just constantly. I documented everything. I'd call CPS. But they would say, are you there with him now? And I'd say, yes. Well, he's safe now, because you're there. <laughs> just like, there is something so wrong here. But I just kept doing what I possibly could. Um, shortly after Ryder turned three, uh, I was at a community forum event on drugs in Franklin. And I was sitting there and I was listening and a mom was up there who had lost her son to a heroin overdose. And she said, looking back, she can clearly remember when he relapsed because he became normal. And she said she learned later that when you're on the drugs, you're normal. You, you know, you can, you know, function when you're off the drugs and going through withdrawals or trying to live clean, that you're more agitated and maybe more quiet. But that was her indication, was that he was normal. And that word just hit me like a ton of bricks. I don't remember anything else that was said that night at that community forum. I sat in my seat till the end, and all I kept thinking was, my daughter's on heroin. And I got in my car. And I drove to her apartment. Uh, I remember it like it was a movie because it was pouring rain out. I got in my car. I, it was sorry because my, um, her dad had passed away uh, about, about a year before that. And I was driving and just all this stuff going through my head. And I got to her house. And I would say nothing, nothing could have ever prepared me for that moment. I walked in her door because I had a key. And she was sitting at the table shooting up heroin. And my grandson was five feet away. And from that moment, I just went into shock. I grabbed my grandson. I called 911. I lied. I said that she overdosed uh, because I knew they would come then. And the paramedics came shortly after that. The police department came. Now, this was in Milwaukee. This was not in West Dallas. In West Dallas, I, I mean, we have less than four-minute response time. Um, I was in Milwaukee, and it was a lot longer than four minutes. But I took my grandson home with me that night, and I vowed that I, was, I would never let him go back. I would do whatever I had to do, but I had to protect him because that was not a life that he should be living. So... It didn't change that I constantly worried about my daughter still. Uh, because my grandson was then, she was arrested, so my grandson was put on a CHIPS petition. So he was never physically removed from my custody, but he was, he, the, the Milwaukee County had custody of him. Um, we went to uh, foster parent training. We became his foster parents. A guardian ad litem was appointed. We went to court every single month for her hearings, my daughter's hearings. 
And afterwards, after the first hearing, the district attorney uh, came up to me. And he said, you have to detach with love or this drug is going to ruin your life as well. And then there'll be no one to take care of that little boy. And that stuck with me. And he was right, I had to learn to detach with love. I could still love my daughter, but it had to be from a different distance because I learned that I couldn't love away the addiction, I couldn't threaten it away, I couldn't scream it away, I couldn't pray it away. There was nothing I could do. And I had to take care of this little boy. So about a year and a half later, it took about a year and a half, uh, my daughter's rights were terminated and we adopted my grandson. And he went to play therapy and occupational therapy. So he's been through a lot, but that's him now. And we don't have sad eyes anymore. We have happy eyes. And he, uh, he does get to see his mom once in a while. When she's doing well, um, he gets to see her. He knows that she has a sickness. And you know, addiction is a disease. And we know that, so we have never told him any different. His mom is sick. Sometimes she's doing better, and sometimes she's not. And so he has learned that, you know, he'll say, is my mom feeling better this week? Can I see my mom? I miss her. And then we call her, and we see if she's doing okay, and if she is, then she sees him. Now, the last six months, she's been doing really well, and seeing him on a regular basis. Um, from when I got Ryder, uh, Alicia would, or Andrea, spent three and a half years in and out of treatment, in and out of jail. At one point she was in jail for over 10 months. Um, I, was at, I went and picked her up from jail uh, because I knew she was clean and I didn't know when she'd ever be clean again. And so I spent that entire day with her and into the evening because that was my time. I wanted that time with her. Because even with all the stuff that we do and all the education and all the trainings we go to, a lot of times I can't tell if she's on drugs or if she's clean. I accept that. And I love her for who she is. I love the memories that we create when we can have her. Um, in active addiction, Andrea has also been homeless twice. She's totaled out at least three vehicles. And she has overdosed at least 12 times that I know of. Um, I'm her mom. So even when she's in active addiction, I make sure she has a roof over her head. I bring food that she likes to her. I buy her birthday presents. I buy her Christmas presents. Uh, she may sell them, but I still, you know, she knows that I love her. Um, it's just a different kind of relationship now. My primary focus has been Ryder. Um, and Ryder always, when he's a very well-adjusted child, when people ask him because he's being raised by his grandma and grandpa, and people say, well, where's your mom? And his response is, you know, he's got a pat answer. He looks at me and says, my mom is sick. And she couldn't take care of me, so my grandma and my grandpa have me. And they're also my parents, so I have a twofer and they're going to keep me forever. And that's pretty much what he tells everyone, and he's good with that. So we go around and talk about this, and we share our story in hopes that others may see some of the signs ahead of time. We hope that people can take something away from this that may help them. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not this year, but maybe sometime you'll remember something that we said that'll be like, oh yeah, and isn't there this organization out there that helps people? And we are, we are the West Dallas, West Milwaukee Hero and Opiate Task Force. We have amazing people like Rod Nelson. We have the health department, the police department. We just have a great team of people that work with us to raise awareness in the community about prescription drugs, about opiates, about heroin, about other substances. We also try to connect people to resources, and we provide support. We are here if parents, you know, often parents 
If your child's going through that, you don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. So sometimes we can connect them to the right people and get them turned in the right direction. So the reality is that you or a parent or your child may be prescribed prescription pain medication. So we have different things that we hope that you'll be able to use. One of the things that we hope that people teach their children that, that they look at is we call it the three R's. Um, respect the power of the medicine and use it properly. Recognize that all medications, including prescription medications, have risks along with benefits, and the risks tend to increase dramatically when the medication is abused. Take responsibly, responsibility for learning how to take prescribed medications safely and appropriately, and seek help at the first sign of a problem. The other thing that we stress that is so important is please do not share prescription medications with anyone. I know it's really easy that you know, a spouse or a partner or a friend is like, oh, I threw out my back. You go, I didn't take all my medication for my surgery and it really helps with the pain. Here, just try one till you can get to the doctor. Don't do that, please. Um, sharing medication is actually considered a felony. Even if you share it with your spouse, your child, it's still considered a felony. And the effects can be devastating. I am going to turn this over to Alicia to talk about a little bit more on the stuff. So to kind of piggyback off, what, off of what my mom was saying, um, we also sit at the table on the Milwaukee County Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition. It's called MixAP, and we have a ton of different agencies that we compare data with and we compare experiences and things with. And because Milwaukee County is such a huge place in our state, we see that a lot of those numbers are happening right in Milwaukee County. So this is just talking about how 4,000 uh, Wisconsin residents age 55 or older were hospitalized for opioid dependence or poisoning. Um, almost 1,000 of Wisconsin's 55 plus population were taken by ambulance for suspected unintentional opioid overd overdoses. And that's why Corporal Nelson, what you guys do in the assisted living homes is so important, teaching these people how to dispose of their medications properly. Um, we have information about drop boxes and stuff as well if you want to grab that. Um, double click it. So usually when we give these presentations, we're talking to certain groups of people, whether it be children or teenagers or parents. So we usually have a specific trail and when we think about addiction as a whole as a community we think about it starting in like you know the younger generation and something that gets worse as you get older but um something to think about is just are you at risk for addiction um one of there's two things that make you at risk for addiction and when you think about your makeup and your susceptibility to it, it's genetics and environment. So um, genetics play a big role, but also your environment plays an even bigger role. And something about that is the trauma and what it does to your brain. Um, it disrupts the chemistry of the brain and it can predispose people to alcohol and drug use, eating disorders, other mental health issues. Um, and when trauma occurs in childhood, it can have lasting effects on the brain development. And we talk about that because trauma doesn't look like it used to. Trauma, the spectrum of trauma has widened and diversified so much. It goes from anything to emotional or sexual or physical abuse, um, domestic violence, any kind of injury that's catastrophic or an illness. So suffering something like that, that's considered trauma. Um, painful, frightening medical procedures, uh, loss of a loved one, abandonment, and divorce, which I think is the biggest one that we overlook as a society, thinking that divorce is actually traumatic. And it can be traumatic to you, to your spouse, to your children. So this all has to do with what's called the ACE study, all of these traumas. And what it is, is it's taking the different traumas and you get a score. And you can actually take this ACE study, this ACE test online. And it's showing that these scores, the higher your scores, the more predisposed and likely you are to suffer from any of the behavior or physical or mental health issues on the right. So any of the traumas that we talked about, if you have had a few of those, you are more likely to 
have any kind of those health issues or engage in smoking, drug use, unhealthy relationships. So there's a huge correlation. Um, the next slide, why isn't a score important? If a male child, for example, has six or more yes answers, so when you take the test, it talks about trauma and asks you questions. If they have six or more of those answers added or answered yes, his risk of becoming an IV drug user increases by 4,600% compared to a child, a boy, with a score of zero. So when we look at kids and how we're predisposed to addiction and why some kids turn to addiction and some kids don't, or you know, even adults, when we think all the way back and trace all those steps back, trauma and how that affects your brain development has something so significant about it. I mean, my sister and I were raised in the exact same home. We come from the same parents, we moved together, we did everything together, and yet when I look back and thinking, okay, what went, what's different? How did we turn out so different? And some of that has to do with the different traumas that we suffered as children and how we dealt with those. So it does impact your brain in a big way. Um, how do we prevent drug abuse? So once you're dealing with the trauma and the mental health piece of all of it and making sure that all of those are being dealt with, another way you can pre prevent it is always asking about the prescription you're getting. So you got your Ask a Doc cards. These are going in all of the folders for all city employees. Um, as we talked about earlier, you bring these and they have a list of questions that you can ask your provider, medical provider. They're great for emergency situations, emergency rooms, because when you just want to get your kids some pain relief or your parent some pain relief or yourself, you're not thinking about asking all those questions. So this is a great empowering tool to just keep in your wallet and kind of just hand out like candy so that everybody can have these. Um, asking those questions is super important. If you do get a prescription medication, um, lock it up. We have lock boxes available, you can get them almost anywhere, um, and monitor them when they're prescribed for your teens or any young people that are in your house or really anyone in your house. Just monitoring them, having one of those seven day planners is a really, pill boxes is a really good way to do that. Um, and talk to your doctor about alternatives. Again, with the ask a doc card, it asks, it has a question there that you can ask if there's any alternative pain relief or pain management strategies that you can use. Um, we have up there an example, 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol and 400 milligrams of ibuprofen. It can give you the same pain relief as five milligrams of hydrocodone. So it gives the same signals to the brain to suppress the pain. And so that's a really good alternative. There we go. So besides being smarter about medication, another thing that I look at when I look at between my sister and I are protective factors and keeping us safe, and that's the first thing on there. Protective factors are people around you that really care about you, people that you can talk to. When we go into the schools, we talk to the kids about having um, a trusted adult, whether that be a teacher, a counselor, a parent, a friend's parent, just somebody that you can go to when, you, when life just isn't going great, somebody that will check in on you and know what's wrong or know if there is something wrong. Um, another way we can keep our kids safe is just conversations about house expectations. Some parents and kids don't necessarily talk about all that stuff very often, and it's good to just bring that conversation to the table to let them know what you expect of them. Maybe they don't know that they're not allowed to jewel. <laughs> so just understanding that there's expectations, and it also allows you to let your children know what you know and let them know, hey, I'm not you know, completely removed from reality. I know what's going on. This is what our expectations are. Um, getting on their level. I say this, I have young children and it's really cool when we're watching Nickelodeon and those puppet commercials, have you ever seen them? They're the puppet commercials and it talks about the vape and every time one of the puppets tries to say that vaping is safer than smoking, the other one goes Bah! And it's just this really cool way that we have a conversation about the dangers of different substances. My son is almost eight, and while I'm not giving him a laundry list of what's happening in the world and what's all out there, he knows that something like that is gonna hurt his body and that he's gonna choose not to do it. So it's just nice to get on their level. If they like video games, sit down and play with them and have a conversation that way. Or you know, just talk to them about their favorite celebrities and you know, stuff like that, but just getting on their level is important. 
Discussing the dangers of substance abuse at their age is super important. I know we talked about brain de development and marijuana, and I think that's a really good example. Just some kids respond better with, look, this is exactly what's going to happen if you use it. Whether it's legal or not, whether it's safe or not, this is what's going to happen to your brain. Regardless of who you are and what you think, this is what's going to happen. So just teaching them that. We do have some information too in our folders about that and on our website, and it just helps to come prepared with facts because some kids don't think that we know what we're talking about. Um, and teaching the importance of consent in regards to drug, drug exposure, it's important to teach them consent about everything in life, but especially drug exposure. They don't have to do things that they don't want to. They don't have to be in a car with people who are drinking. They don't have to do any of that, and their body is their own, and they need to give somebody permission to do anything to it, especially drugs and alcohol and any kind of things like that. Peer pressure, that was the term that was coined in the 80s and 90s with it, and it's kind of lost its effect, but just giving kids the power to be able to control what they put into their bodies. Another way we keep them safe is to know the current social media apps and trends, which are changing on a daily basis. Um, we've compiled a list on our website as well. These are some of the main ones that are floating around there. Um, these are just really important for parents to look out for. They are many times unmonitored um, social interacting sites. Um, Instagram we is getting really big and we know of. Snapchat is where the picture or the message goes away in 10 seconds. But I always tell my high school kids that sure that goes away in 10 seconds, but a screenshot lasts forever. And the last thing you want to be explaining to your future employer is why that picture's on the internet from you know 15 years ago. So it's just important to for us as parents to know the different social media apps and trends, and two, to just have that conversation with our kids so that they, they know that we know. Oh, so now we're gonna turn it off over to Corpor Corporal Nelson before we do our teen replica room. I just wanted to talk about some of the current trends that we're dealing with in our high schools. Um, one of the things that we are dealing with currently is um, the vaping, the electronic cigarettes. That's been one of our biggest problems now. Um, they actually look as simple as a hard drive. Um, this is actually one we took from a student at one of our local high schools. We had several of them to choose from because we've taken several of these away. Um, but this is just one of the things that happens in the schools. They start with this, and sometimes parents say they think this is okay. The problem is, all they do is separate it, and instead of just smoking vapor, they're smoking some kind of nicotine in there, they can put um, THC in there, they can put anything, they can smoke anything they choose in these things, and the parents aren't aware of that regularly. So that's one of the trends that we see coming. Um, I can tell you that more kids today have understood the dangers of smoking cigarettes, so they've gotten out of that. Um, I, I'm happy to announce that we're actually, with a lot of our, our promotional items and people talking like this, that we've actually shut down, or at least made kids responsible where they're not having as many drinking parties and stuff like that, but yes, are we having problems with um, heroin? We certainly are. And heroin is because we have the problem with the medications medications, kids get them. As they explained, it was their daughter was only 12 when she first started taking medications from a doctor, was consumed with it by the time she was 16. And it happens to good people. I often use the example of Brett Favre. Brett Favre, great athlete, and we all loved him. But unfortunately, he fell into the same addiction. He admitted he was addicted to opiates. He had a doctor that would give him all the opiates he wanted. So he didn't have to go to heroin. But the people that don't have the opportunity and time to spend with a doctor and get anything they want will go to heroin. And one thing I learned from this all is that I learned that kids and adults that have this, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, it's a sad thing to happen, and I've seen it happen to families just like the Lukies here, and uh, don't want to see it happen to your kids. So please
please think about it, be involved in your kid's life, talk with them. If you ever have any questions, feel free to contact me or this group right here and they can help you out. Thank you. Now we're gonna go over and show you some of the things for our teen replica room. Uh, this is our KIPP room called Knowledge is Power because truthfully, the more we know, the more we can help prevent or identify uh, problems before they escalate. So, So some of the first things that we're gonna show you guys, again, this is a replica of a teen's bedroom. We're not 100% mobile yet, but um, we hope to get there soon. Um, it's supposed to show all of the different hiding places that we've identified in teen's bedrooms. We got most of these items either online or when my mom shamelessly walked into Spencer Gifts and they were just on a wall. You can Google it. Um, some of the things that we have here to conceal alcohol, um, grape soda, it perfectly masks the smell of almost anything on your breath, including alcohol. Um, a lot of teens these days are just using regular water bottles. No parent would really suspect that anything's different. I mean, I had 15 empty, half empty water bottles next to my bed growing up, and sh a simple shake of it can tell you if there's any alcohol in it. If it bubbles up, there can be a substance in it. If it's not, if it's just flat, you're probably good. These are different containers that we found. This is like, um, a sunscreen container that's actually a flask. Just got a wider bottom, and actually in the back it says directions. You know, fill the capacity, wash thoroughly after every use, dry completely. Um, food grade plastic that you can use at a concert, festival, festival, beach, fair, sporting event, amusement parks, cruises, golf courses, everywhere. So, I mean, it says right on the bottle. So that's a little bit easier to identify. Um, there's a ton of these going around. They're mugs with false bottoms. And I actually have shaker cups like this, so you don't have to specifically go somewhere for your kids to find this. I have a shaker cup just like this, and the bottom just comes off. Um, we've seen hair brushes where the top, the back screws off, um, an ice pack. This one doesn't say. Oh yeah, keep your drinks cool and fresh for hours in here. Um, so just different things like that. Suspicious lotion bottles that don't have any lotion in them. Um, so these are all different things that can conceal alcohol. Different trends as well are the gummy bears that we're seeing. These are great for bachelorette parties if you're over 21. They're really popular at summer barbecues. This is on Pinterest. I mean, these are just things that we're seeing out in the plain old world, not even just concealing alcohol. But you soak them in vodka or your white liquor of choice, clear liquor of choice, and kids can bring these into school. So it's just really important too to just be aware of what your kids are hanging on to. Um, again, with the lotion bottles and the ice pack, another thing that was really just shocking to us, um, they have flasks that are disguised as tampons. No dad is going to go through his daughter's tampon box. I can guarantee you that. But in here, it's called a booze tube, smugglingyourbooze.com. Like, it's just, they're everywhere. And this specifically says tampon on the side, which you will never see. You will see feminine hygiene product. You will see a million other things. It will never say tampon on it, so that's another clear indication. This is just some more follow-up on what Corporal Nelson said, the e-cigarettes, just different ways that they're, that kids are using them now. Um, aggressive marketing, the flavors that they're using. Um, the top left are some of what they look like. Um, again, a simple Google search will give you a lot of information about vaping and stuff that you can be aware of. This is specifically a Juul brand, the new teen vaping fad, taking over school bathrooms. Um, the kids can't stop. It's an epidemic among US high schoolers. We're also seeing it in our middle schools, so it's important to talk to your kids early about it because that's sixth, seventh, and eighth grade here. Some posters and some marijuana memorabilia, the marijuana culture, anything with 420 or the pot leaves, you know, the Rastafarian flag is sometimes associated with it. 
Those are just things to talk to your kids about. Um, another, other things to look out for, for specifically, this is for specifically for marijuana. Um, toilet paper tubes with a dryer sheet over them. You can just blow out smoke. It just it masks the smell. So this is something to look for. Anything used to smoke it, a cord out apple, a handmade pipe, Altoid tin, because nobody actually keeps Altoids in there anymore. It's all different things from pills to pot, kind of anything. So just things to be lookful or looking out for. Um, my mom, I'm gonna pass it over to my mom. She's gonna talk a little bit more about the prescription drugs and pills. So just some of the things that can be red flags are cut up straws, um, empty pens, because they use that to um, chop them up and snort them, uh, mirrors, CD cases. If you're taking a prescription medication, we highly encourage you to, number one, count how many pills you have. We have medication logs. Keep a log of them. The other thing is know what your pills look like because these look like hydrocodone. They're vitamins. And youth will often, and actually even adults, will keep a handful of these vitamins in their pocket, and then they go to grandma's house or who's ever house, they see that they have hydrocodone, and they just exchange a couple. And all of a sudden, you know, grandma's not getting any relief from taking her medication. So we strongly encourage you to know exactly what your pill looks like. They have, you know, usually a little engraving on them. They always have a number on them. And again, count how many you have. Uh, different, again, with purses, we always encourage people to pull the bottom out because what they do is they cut the lining and then they put everything under the lining. Because then when their purse is searched, they don't see anything. So that's the other thing that we encourage people to do. Um, when you're looking in a child or anyone's closet, hoodies are a great place to conceal things. You have the hood, you have the pocket, uh, the, cup, the cups of the sleeve facing in. I used to literally go in and pat every single thing in the closet. The other thing is on shirts. Lifting up the front of the shirt and there can be, if there's a white chalky substance, it's not deodorant. Um, what happens is with most prescription pain pills, there's a coating on the outside and it lessens the high. So many people will take their shirt, put it in there and scratch off the, co the coating before they crush it or take it because they get a more instant high and a stronger high by doing that. These are just some of the other things that, I mean, the brush I bought at Spencer's, and there's a whole area on concealing alcohol. Pills fit, fit in the brush. Pills fit in a lot of these items. Um, they call this a California safe. You can buy them online where they look like a book. But also many kids now just take one of their books and cut, a, cut out part of the middle hide the stuff in there, and put it back on their bookshelf. So they're just different things to look at, different red flags that we see. Um, we don't talk much about heroin, but a looped belt, no one takes off their belt, throws it on, and loops it before they throw it on the floor. They just don't. That's often used as a tourniquet. Um, the backs of bare, you know, stuffed animals, shoving, cutting it and shoving stuff in the back. With pills, we also look for blood on the pillowcase. Um, that can often be an indication because they get bloody noses anytime they're snorting stuff. This is what they call a kit. Many heroin users have a kit that they take everywhere with them. Um, and they like it close by. So you're typically going to find that in a Kleenex box, under the mattress, between the bed sheets, uh, inside the fitted sheet, under their pillow, 
any place in their room or in the bathroom. Um, in the back of the toilet, they'll pull that off. A lot of them pull the registers off, look for smudges by the registers, because they often take that out and put their kit inside. And this is just more stuff to look at. We highly encourage people to drug test their kids. Why do you drug test your kids? Number one, because it gives you clarity and you know whether or not there is a problem. Number two, I'm gonna, you know, Alicia was my prime example. She'd go out and maybe with some people that I would not have chosen, and they knew that she couldn't do anything because she always said, my mom randomly drug tests me. I can't do that. So it also gave her an out. And same thing with breathalyzing when she came home at night. I can't drink nothing. My mom's going to breathalyze me. You know, she's nuts. She does it every single time. And I did. But it also gave her that opportunity. And then it wasn't on her. It was on me. So we do have drug tests available. Anyone can contact us. Our information is on our Facebook page and on our website. Our website is wawmheroinopiatetaskforce.com. And you also can reach us on our Facebook. We have the drug tests, and um, we buy them in big quantities, so we can uh, give them to you for $5. And we just need to cover our costs and our shipping. But these are the same as the $39.99 one that you buy at Walgreens, which, you know, for parents, I know that I wasn't going to randomly drug test my child if I was paying $40 a pop. But if I'm paying $5, I'm definitely more likely to do that. So we have surveys. If you could please collect, uh, fill out the surveys. If you have any questions, we can answer your questions. We're going to stay here after. Uh, we thank you all for coming. And again, we are from the West Dallas, West Milwaukee Heroin Opiate Task Force. We are a great team of people from the community that all work together to try to address these, the heroin opiate em epidemic, to raise awareness about prescription drugs, and also to tie in and reach youth to raise awareness for prevention. Thank you for having us. <laughs>